Welcome, everyone, to Nutrition 107, or Introduction to Nutrition. Now, since Wexford offers a master's level degree in exercise and nutrition, courses like this one actually serve for a foundation or a base for students to build upon and get ready for higher levels of more intense learning. So in that way, this course is an introductory type course, and it does cover a lot, but not as deeply as higher levels of degree programs do. So we do have a lot to get covered, and we've got a lot to learn and a lot to share. So um, your textbook is before you. You should have that and review it. Um, just keep in mind that as you go through these slideshows, some of them are a little bit off theme, and these are actually provided by the uh, publisher, so they are what they intend for us to use as study materials for this course. So you'll notice a little bit of variation in themes or content, but just go ahead and study both for your our exams and you'll be okay. So let's go ahead and get started. Now we need to start making some connections between health overall and nutrition. So in terms of looking at health status, we would need to understand first a little bit about genetics and then also even more about lifestyle. So we can have some sort of influence in the lifestyle factors that bridge the gap between health and nutrition, whereas genetics is pretty much what we get from our family lineage and not really under much of our control. So that just kind of is how it is. But lifestyle, things like being active or sedentary are just ways that influence whether or not we have good quality of life in some cases or even our morbidity, mortality, and longevity. So we have to understand genetics and lifestyle are strong determinants of a population's health status overall. So in the United States, here are some more facts. First, that six of 10 of the leading causes of death are listed in the bullet points below, and they probably aren't surprising for anyone. And maybe a little bit surprising to see that 80% of all deaths come from this particular grouping of six, because when you think about the six that are on the screen before you, they are all what we call preventable. So these are a little bit different than those that are non-preventable, like dying of natural causes or old age or death from accidents where it's not anything that's based on a lifestyle per se. So we're not doing maybe as good of a job at our health if you look at the health status of the American public. Both science and the research indicate that genetics may account for up to 30% of one's life expectancy. So a lot of how long we live is determined, again, by what's passed down through our family lines. So that's not really something that we can control. However, lifestyle, especially when you look at these environmental factors, uh, are more controllable for the individual. So things like food intake or diet, this is naturally an expression of the health status of this group that we're looking at. So we'd want to know how they eat and what the trends are. We'd also look at how physically active this group is. So are they a sedentary society or are they very active? And then lastly, we'd look at medicine. How much medicine does this group use or how does this group respond to medicine or how much medicine is being used to, in fact, sustain life or increase longevity. So these are things that we'd have to look at to consider health status. Now we'll look at the risk factors that are involved. And you can see that by definition, a risk factor would be a healthy behavior that's associated with a given disease. So for instance, smoking would be a risk factor for lung cancer. So all of these items here, these risk factors that you see, again, some of them are preventable. Family history, the first one being the really the only one that's not. Cigarette smoking, a personal choice, as well as alcohol consumption or the lack of moderation um, can trend into different areas of psychology and outside of what we discuss. But still, if alcohol consumption is part of the nutrition profile of the person that you're working with, then it is a risk factor if it's excessive. Um, obviously, poor dietary habits and then physical inactivity, also not surprising to see on the list of risk factors that we see in the population. 
there is a pretty strong connection between the field of nutrition and sport and exercise performance. And this actually is almost a collaboration between the science of nutrition and the influence, once again, of genetics. Because things like stature, body composition, VO2 max, and vision are all either directly or indirectly affected by nutrition. So this is why it's a natural relationship to see nutritionists working in sport or exercise performance-based environments. And this is a very good thing. We also see that the role of the nutritionist is vital in terms of optimizing training in both physiological and psychological ways. It's important for us to take a moment to define physical fitness because throughout this course and the book that's used and other courses that you're likely to take in this field, you will hear the term physical fitness, fitness, physical activity or activity used interchangeably and that can be a little bit sloppy so we want to define it this way. Basically, physical fitness is a set of abilities that the individual possesses to perform specific types of physical activity. So that's why it's a little bit different than physical activity in general as a descriptor. And it includes essentially only two modes. We have sport-related and then we have health-related fitness. So if you're working in the general public in the health club circuit or doing personal training or running boot camps, it would be more health-related fitness. Whereas if you're working with team or organized sports, it would be maybe sport-related fitness. So there's two different ways that we need to understand fitness because the needs of the people who participate in the different modes are very different. The descriptors that we use to describe health-related fitness are also items that we call metrics, or in other words, these are things that can be measured, so body weight, body composition, and cardiorespiratory fitness, as well as muscular strength and endurance, and lastly, flexibility. These are all things that we can measure. Um, we also have a significant other category, um, also made up of mostly metrics, um, but you can see the first and indicator of nutrition kind of creeping into health-related fitness here with identifying uh, carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. In other words, what's our carb intake and what's our fat intake and what's the quality of these particular items. So this would be under the um, descriptor of health-related fitness. We took a moment to define physical fitness, and now, because it's different by definition, we'll look at physical activity instead. So this is more specific in that it states that it's any movement caused by muscular contraction that results in caloric expenditure. So anything that would be what we call unstructured, like the activities of daily living or ADLs, like maybe gardening or washing your car or even doing housework, these are all unstructured but still represent calorie burn above baseline so they do count then we have the more structured planned program design type workouts that are what you would see between a personal trainer and his or her client and can include things like aerobic and anaerobic exercise and is what we call program design we had mentioned previously carbohydrate and lipid metabolism as descriptors for health-related fitness. Now we're going to take one further step and describe how nutrition and exercise, both sciences, come together to help support health-related fitness. So if you should find yourself working in an exercise environment or sports or performance-based environment, you may want to be aware of some basic principles of exercise training, and they include the items that are scrolling on your screen for you. Now, we will actually take some time to dive into each of these and understand them a little bit more because they're fairly important in terms of providing structure for people who work in our particular field or discipline. 
Overload is described as the main or basic principle of all exercise training and is essentially a way that we describe intensity. So if we're talking about cardiovascular modes versus strength training modes, then we describe the intensity differently for each different type. We also have to look at overload in terms of duration, and this is really just speaking to the amount of time in an exercise session. But we also look at frequency, which relates to how many times during the week an exercise session is performed. Progression is another basic or key exercise principle and is basically related to gradual increases in overloading with particular training modes. So it might mean that we have our clients run faster if we're doing running programs, or it might mean that we manipulate the strength training variables to include maybe more weight lifted or more power used during different types of movements. So the element of progression is where we're actually actually imposing an overload situation upon the client by making them do more beyond what their baseline value is and thereby progressing them to a higher level of conditioning. The principle of specificity is also related to the said principle or the principle of specific adaptations to imposed demands. In other words, what we're saying here that if we have an endurance training athlete that we're basically going to be doing endurance type training modes with that athlete in order to specifically target and progress or overload what their body can do. So we're looking at variables that would influence how they run or how they cycle or how they swim to impact their endurance. Or if we're looking at strength training, we would look at variables related to muscular strength or power, like mentioned in the previous slide, and the overall muscle mass or goal of the client. And we'd also be looking at ways to measure muscular endurance as well so that we can really be specific about ways to improve, again, something else that we're measuring. Sometimes people forget to look at recovery or recuperation as it's being used here in terms of it having a dual side to it. In other words, there's the recovery time in between sets during the exercise session, and then there's the recovery or recuperation time in between actual workouts between the workouts during a week. So there's a couple of different ways that we have to look at recovery, time in between sets or exercises, and time in between workouts. The individuality principle behind exercise is related to how each particular subject responds to exercise training. And this can involve, again, more metrics or things that are measured and can include blood pressure, metabolism or resting metabolism, resting heart rate and resting metabolic rate, as well as body composition. So things like percent body fat and body weight are all individual components that can be assessed and are one of the principles of exercise training. We have known for a long time of the phrase, use it or lose it, and generally most exercise professionals agree that health gains that are achieved will gradually disappear if we detrain or stop working out. We also have to look at the benefits of even just one exercise session for those clients who need to take things in baby steps or one step at a time, and how just one exercise session can improve or lower blood pressure, or one exercise session can decrease blood sugar response for someone who's maybe pre-diabetic or sensitive to carb intake. We also need to understand how chronic exercise training is really required to maximize the health benefits of exercise. As an exercise principle, overuse is not really one that we want to promote because what it really means is that the body is excessively exercising or doing too much, and this in turn can have adverse health effects. So things like muscular injuries or musculoskeletal injuries or even fatigue on a physical or mental level and the possibility of stress fractures are all indicators of overuse and overtraining. So this is something that we, again, do not want to promote or support, but it's definitely something that we need to be aware of as an exercise principle. 
We're going to rely on the expertise of your book to explain more on the items that are coming up before you in bullets. But in general, what we're going to do is talk about the influence of exercise on health promotion. So take one item here, just intermediate term cause for a type 2 diabetic. We can actually take this particular marker of health promotion and quantify it by saying how much does it cost a diabetic to maintain their health and get decent care compared to someone who never has diabetes or someone in poor control of their diabetes. So these are quantifiable measures. We can further quantify the role of exercise and health promotion when we look at the data released here from the United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention, indicating that with just considering physical inactivity, 45% are at increased risk of coronary artery disease, 60% for stroke, 30% for hypertension or high blood pressure, and 59% are at increased risk for osteoporosis. Sometimes we think about exercise and how it can benefit those who manage chronic conditions or disease, but we also have to recognize and acknowledge those who are casual fitness enthusiasts who get benefits from doing exercises in terms of it preventing pre-disease conditions. This can include even just abdominal fat accumulating around the waistline as an indicator or risk factor for obesity, or even glucose levels that are unchecked or elevated in the blood, and even type 2 diabetes. With respect to diabetes, we can also expect that the worldwide population will see the numbers for those affected by type 2 diabetes to double. Have you ever thought about trying to describe nutrition? What would you use in terms of the words to describe what it means? Well, let's go ahead and throw one out there so that we can all agree. The overall definition of nutrition is the sum total of processes involved in intake and utilization of food substances by living organisms, including ingestion, digestion, absorption, transport, and metabolism of nutrients in food. So if you think about it, many times what we hear or think of when we hear the word nutrition is food, and we think about eating good quality food and in the right amounts, but nutrition is actually a process. Human life requires six nutrients. The first that we'll discuss are macronutrients and include carbohydrates, fats or lipids, and proteins. Then we have the micronutrients, which include vitamins and minerals. The sixth nutrient is water and is sometimes classified as a macronutrient in terms of how much of it we need to live, but it's not a source of energy for us. According to the American College of Sports Medicine and the American Dietetic Association, it is athletes as a group who are most likely to experience vitamin and mineral deficiencies. This is mainly due to those who fit these criteria, including those who restrict their energy intake maybe to make weigh-in, or those who have severe weight loss practices, again, for someone making weigh-in or a history of eating disorders or disordered eating. This also includes those who might eliminate one or more of the food groups from their diet or one or more of the macronutrients from their diet. And lastly, those who consume unbalanced diets are at risk for malnutrition in terms of vitamins and minerals. Throughout this course, we will learn how nutrition will affect athletic performance. But in general, we will look at the role that nutrients play in terms of providing energy, regulating metabolic processes, and the promotion of growth or development of the subject or athlete. We will wrap up here with a quick summary of how research has gone for nutrition. So in the beginning, nutrition research was based on identifying nutrients in food or the simple things like the science of determining the function of specific nutrients. Now current research seems to be more focused on food and nutrients and the health benefits or the potential performance enhancing effects of food intake. And so with that in mind, it's expected that we will continue to build on the research and make more evidence-based recommendations based on what we collect in terms of data and using databases, but will also be influenced by the nature of research and the process of research as well.